I am curious though, in terms of price, I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, talking about price, you know, there's not much to say a market's going to, you know, a price is going to go up and down, but in terms of the XOR token, the Zor token, I'm curious to talk about this a little bit because of the token bonding curve. And I've, I've heard, I've heard you talk about how, um, so in theory, the Zor price should be somewhat stable. It should kind of trade within, within the range, I guess, a smaller range than some tokens because it, it's tied to the token bonding curve. Um, and yet since the launch of Pokeswap and the, you know, the whole market did crash and we saw Zor kind of crash with the market. Um, and I heard you talk about that being because the token bonding curve has not yet fully been collateralized. And so I'm just wondering, uh, was your hope when you launched, was your hope that it would be fully collateralized by now? How does it become fully collateralized? And, and what is the strategy, I guess, to, to get there? Yeah, so you don't actually need full collateralization for it to be effective. Uh, we have out of, the, so today there's around 350,000, it's actually 345,000 Zor uh, in circulation. Out of this, around 55,000 or so are locked into validators. So these are not having any economic effect, right? Because they're locked up, they're not doing right. anything. And then there's another, um, Another like 120,000 or so of uh, Zor that are locked into um, liquidity pools. So these these have some economic effect because if you trade into them, you know it, it's giving liquidity in the markets. But but you know they're not uh, they're not dumpable tokens because they're they're kind of locked up, right? So it's like 170,000, 180,000 Zor uh, are kind of non uh, floating. Um, from that standpoint, right? So what that means is for the, you know, you have like another, uh, well, like maybe 170,000, 160,000, 170,000 Zor that, um, that are floating. So you need to collateralize this. Um, at least, you know, not everyone's gonna dump when the this market goes down, so you don't really need full collateralization, but you do need collateralization of maybe 80,000 Zor, um, which, which we didn't have when the market went down uh, in May. I was kind of hoping that, uh, that things would continue to to go up uh, for a few more weeks or so, so that we could continue to build up reserves because we were actually doing quite well in building up reserves uh, when the market started to turn down in, in May. Um, so I was watching uh, the, the, particularly ETH and DAI uh, reserves in the token bonding curve. And um, I think at the peak uh, before the crash in, in May, uh, we had, uh, I think, around 300 or 400 ETH and around uh, maybe 5 million DAI or something like that. Maybe it's like 4 million DAI. Um, so these reserves were eaten immediately uh, within a, a day or two when the um, uh, market was going down and people were selling. When you sell into the reserves, the tokens are burned. So it reduces the supply. That's why we burned from the peak, we burned uh, around 15,000 Zor, which is a quite quite a substantial amount of Zor. But it costs us all the all the reserves in the token bonding curve, right? So, um, so what what that means really is that uh, you know uh, four million Dai and 300 or so ETH were not enough. Uh, maybe I think if we had had maybe three to four times that amount. Uh, we could have uh, we could we could have reached a, a stable a more stable price of Zor um, that was within the, the target of volati volatility band. Uh, the volatility band is the the price that the token bonding curve sells uh, new Zor for, and the price that it buys back for. Um, there's actually a 29% uh, margin because it's 20% margin normally, and when it's under collateralized, there's an extra 9% that's tacked on. So it's 29% margin between the high and the low. Um, and so Zor was never meant to be a stable coin, but it was meant to be predictable. And if you can, um, if you can get it to be float within this volatility band, then uh, you get some predictability and that can bootstrap uh, the economic system much more easily. It's easier to talk to people and get them to accept Zor if you have some expectations about what it's going to be worth in a month, right? Right. So, 
I, so I how, how, how do you, is that still the goal is, is to get it to that range, that 29% range? And I guess because the prices dropped so much from the launch, would, is this the new range for Zor or is there a way that you see it getting, it, is the ideal range for it where it launched, which I think was around the $600 mark, or does it not matter? Well, the token bonding curve uh, starts at um, at like nine hundred, like eight ninety five right now, and it will buy. Uh, so that's what it sells Zor for, but it will buy Zor uh, about thirty percent less. So yeah, um, yeah. Right now it's trading, I think, one fifty or so. So it's significantly below the uh, the target volatility range. Um, but it'll eventually reach the volatility range because uh, every transaction burns Zor, so the supply is reducing every day. And right. It's really continuously going down. Um, so just from use, and because there's, um, the, uh, it's the native token of the network, so there's some intrinsic value or intrinsic utility of the token. Uh, it's able to, it's being used for staking on the validators. It's also being used in referendums. If you vote on chain, you vote by bonding Zor. Um, to become a council member, you bond Zor. Um, so all these, there's many uses for Zor. Transaction fees, you know, to reduce spam on the network, these are also paid in Zor. So, uh, and, and also uh, liquidity uh, on Pokeswap. So all liquidity pairs are with respect to Zor. Uh, so there's quite a lot of utility that Zor has just intrinsically based on the system design and additionally every transaction burns a small amount of zor it's a small amount but it's, it's non zero zero so eventually uh, you will hit a point where the you burn so much of the supply that the you know you, you'll be going up back up to the uh where the supply is managed by the token binding curve uh, contract right. rather than um you know kind of by the secondary market secondary markets or the market trends yeah that makes sense so when will this happen? Um, I mean, that's uh, you know anyone's guess. I think it's not too critical of a situation right now, but it is important um, for long-term expectations. So I don't know if you've seen the news. There's people in El Salvador, uh, for whatever reason, you know, protesting the new Bitcoin law. Uh, and one of the comments that they were making, the protesters were making, was that you know if you get paid like you know thirty dollars today in Bitcoin, it could be five dollars tomorrow. Um, which which is which is true, right? Um, I, I think they also could have mentioned that you could pay thirty dollars for transaction fees, but um, that's not that's another comment. Um, so to really be useful in situations like that, if you like, if you want a country to use Zor, um, you have to have uh, some what's called forward guidance or you know forward predictability of uh, of, a, of the token, and that's really what the token bonding curve is supposed to to give us. Um, and you don't need full collateralization, like I said, you just need um, maybe a third of the token supply, maybe 15 to 30% of the token supply should be collateralized um, for it to okay. be effective um, in most market conditions, I would say. 